So with that housekeeping complete, uh, it's my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce Ma Maxi Michuk, Megan Peters, and Jenny Setchell. Maxi Michuk completed her doctoral studies in rehabilitation science at the University of Alberta, and she's currently a postdoctoral fellow at, uh, at Alberta Innovates and the University of Alberta, serving as the inaugural Cy Frank Fellow in Impact Assessment. Her research focuses on operationalizing patient-centered care by developing, implementing, and evaluating care models that impact the patient-practitioner therapeutic relationship, including how health services and policies support this relationship. And she is currently engaged in developing frameworks to evaluate research impact on informed decision-making and the scale and spread of research and innovation in the health system. Jenny Setchell currently hold, holds conjoint research fellow positions in physiotherapy at the Universities of Queensland and Toronto. Her research interests include post-structuralist critical perspectives on healthcare broadly and physiotherapy specifically. Her PhD was in psychology, focused on weight stigma in physiotherapy. Dr. Setchell also has 20 years of diverse clinical physiotherapy experience in Australia and internationally, primarily in the musculoskeletal and sports subdisciplines. She's a founding member and co-chairs the Executive Committee of the International Critical Physiotherapy Network, and she's also a member of the International Society for Critical Health Psychology. And Megan Peters is a physiotherapist at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Edmonton, who has personal experience with the local trans community and is passionate about trans equality and gender issues in healthcare. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Maxi Michuk to start us off on diversity and inclusion in physiotherapy practice. Maxi? Great. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, and I, I just want to say, and I think that I'm speaking on behalf of, of uh, Megan and Jenny when I say uh, thank you to Leanne and to Physiotherapy Alberta for having us speak to diversity and inclusion in physiotherapy practice. Um, I don't know that many people know this, but Albertans have actually uh, taken a leadership role in um, in fighting for um, and upholding uh, LGBTQ rights uh, in Canada. Um, uh, the first, um, uh, a man by the name of Delvin Vreend, an Albertan who worked at King's College in 1991, was actually fired for being gay. And over the course of seven years, the LGBTQ community in Alberta, as well as the allies in Alberta, um, fought that case through the court system, went to the Supreme Court, and won their case, and in 1998, that case, uh, with that case, the Supreme Court ruled that the that um, uh, gender I, that actually sexual orientation be written into the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And so, with that, Physiotherapy Alberta is taking a huge leadership role in actually once again um, uh, working for, uh, for, for the rights and, and safety of the LGBT community. So I just want to thank, uh, thank uh, Physiotherapy Alberta for that. And so um, uh, in terms of introductions, uh, Leanne's already introduced us, um, but uh, I, I just want to put uh, names to voices. And as she said, my name is Maxi Michek, and my pronouns are she and her. My name's Megan. My pronouns are she, her, or they, them. And I'm Jenny Setchell, and my pronouns are any one um, you prefer. I'm not fussed. And so today we're going to go through uh, bias and implicit bias uh, within, within clinical practice. We'll give you a bit of a primer on gender and sexuality, um, and then review the scope of health challenges uh, very briefly, actually, uh, with the LGBTQ uh, community. And then move into speaking a little bit about um, the inclusivity and diversity movement uh, internationally as well as, as within our own context. Uh, and then moving through to creating how to create safe ther therapeutic spaces with this population. And then focusing a little bit more on, um, on the trans, uh, trans health in physiotherapy. So... What we would like you to do, what we're going to invite you to do, is to sit back and, and take stock of what automatically comes to mind when you see the following images. Thank you. 
So from the images that, that just flashed in front of you, what did you assume about the gender or the sexual, sexual orientation of the people within those images? And maybe what was driving some of those assumptions that you had? Was it the way a person looked? Uh, was it the clothes that they were wearing? Or was it institutional values, uh, such as values of marriage or sport? What we're trying to get across is that maybe you had some implicit biases or some biases based on, on what, you, what you saw that would lead you to make assumptions about gender and sexuality. And what we want to be really clear about is that we all have implicit biases. Um, and so an implicit bias is, is an unconscious bias that our brains automatically uh, associate a stereotype or an attitude about a particular group. Um, and typically it's outside of our conscious awareness. So what we want to be clear about is that, that with unconscious biases come behaviors, right? But unconscious behaviors are important. They allow us to function. And so our implicit biases actually help us structure our interactions. I mean, if we had to actually be uh, consciously aware of every single decision and every single action that we took throughout our days, it'd be pretty paralyzing. And so we understand that the way we operate, um, we, need, we need implicit biases or we need structures and, and, and associations to get through the day. However, we need to be aware that our implicit biases can actually be hurtful um, and, uh, and can disempower people. Um, and it's also very interesting to note that our implicit biases can often be better predictors of our behavior than our conscious values. So you may absolutely be an advocate for and an ally uh, for LGBTIQ people. Um, however, the implicit structures that guide our, our assumptions and our behaviors actually may come through in different ways during your day. So one of, one of the ways these implicit biases affect us is, um, as a society is that it creates a situation called normativity. So this is when um, the um, assumption, it's the assumption that the experience of the majority applies to everyone. So um, in, in this context, in the LGBTQ context, this means that there is heteronormativity, so the assumption that um, everyone is heterosexual, um, and cisnormativity, which is the assumption that everyone is cisgendered or that their gender identity matches their sex assigned at birth. Um, so, and what this does is it, it erases the, um, the marginalized people or the less common identities, um, the minorities, um, and it forces the minorities to speak up to correct these assumptions. Um, and when they're doing that, they have to do that from a place of less privilege um, and already from a place of potentially feeling threatened. Um, and so they either have to hide their identities and go along with that assumption of normativity or, um, or find the courage to speak up and potentially put themselves in, in more danger or risk that um, happening. So I'm going to take you through some basic terminology just so that we all have the same understandings of gender and sexuality to get through the presentation and move forward. Um, we definitely encourage you to look up more on this um, in, the, in the terminology realm and um, the information about gender and sexuality. And throughout the presentation, we'll be giving you a bunch of different links of where to find that information. Um, I can't give you everything in this presentation, so I definitely encourage you to um, continue to seek that out. Um, this graphic is a great um, one to use. Um, you can use it with your staff. You can find it online. Um, it's free. Um, there's lots of different versions of it. I think this is the most recent one here. Um, what it's showing, um, I, I just want to point out it's called the genderbred person, not the gingerbread person or gingerbread man, so that's intentional, um, very punny. Um, what it's showing is that there's um, four different scales, and actually five that are shown here, So, and they're all completely separate. Um, so the first one is gender expression. 
Um, so, or gender identity, sorry. So this is how someone feels in terms of being a man or a woman or neither or both um, or a third gender altogether. Um, and so typically we're taught that gender is a binary. There is male and female and you are one or the other. Um, what this is trying to show is that there is a spectrum and you can fall on both of those um, spectrums. You can fall on one um, or the other. You can fall at zero um, or um, completely female or completely male. Um, and that's your gender identity. So that's how you feel. Um, then there's gender expression. So that's how you present yourself to the world. Um, this does not always have to match your gender identity. Um, there's lots of people that feel completely female and present fairly masculinely. There's some people, the less, um, less accepted in society, who can feel completely male and present fairly femininely, um, et cetera, any combination of those. Um, the next one is biological sex. So this includes chromosomes, um, secondary sex characteristics, hormones, um, genitalia, um, and this is sex assigned at birth. So what you're assigned um, is where that starts. And then uh, for people that transition um, in medical ways, uh, this can shift somewhat um, depending on whether they're taking hormones or have various types of surgery, and we'll go through a little bit of that later. Um, and then the last one is who you're attracted to. So that's what we typically call sexual orientation or romantic orientation. Um, and again, those are a spectrum. Um, and so the, the most important thing about this is all four of these are spectrums and all four of these are completely separate from each other, um, which, which is really, keep coming back to this concept because it's really hard to, to kind of wrap your head around that initially when you're going through this type of information. Um, so I want to go through some basic terms. Um, LGBTQIA2S plus is the ac full acronym that, that you might hear. Um, so that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Um, the other T is, is typically um, transsexual, which is an older term. Some older transgender people may still use that term, but it's not in common use um, uh, with the newer generation. Um, I is intersex, so that's someone who um, is born with um, sexual characteristics of both or um, ambiguous sexual characteristics. Um, Q is queer, and then 2S is two-spirited, which is a, um, a Aboriginal or Indigenous term um, that is both cultural, a cultural term as well as an identity. Um, and not all um, people who um, identify as two-spirited, all, all two-spirited people must be Indigenous. You can't use that term if you are not Indigenous. Um, but um, not all Indigenous queer people will identify as two-spirited. Um, and then the plus is for anything that, because language is, is fluid, the community is fluid, so that's for anything that kind of gets left out. Um, so sex is typically um, described as sex assigned at birth in the trans community especially. Um, we went through some of those other terms. Um, trans is a typical term, umbrella term that's used nowadays. Transgender is fine. Non-binary is a term that's used for people who fall anywhere in and among between the male and female typical binary. Um, and dysphoria is another term I wanted to mention. That's the experience of um, trans people or non-binary people um, where their body feels or their identity that they were assigned at birth feels wrong somehow it feels you feel at odds with that whether it's um socially so being called terms that relate to the sex you were assigned at birth feel really uncomfortable to, to you um, your name maybe or physically so parts of your body can feel really uncomfortable and often it takes a long time for people to figure out what that discomfort is and find words to describe it and find ways to address it so i'll be using that term throughout as well right so moving to moving to the big picture or the scope of of disparity within um, the LGBTQ population. So uh, as a whole, um, and this is a pretty broad statement, but as a whole, this this population, this community, um, experiences disproportionately higher rates of discrimination, stigmatization, and violence. 
And this contributes to disparities um, health with health outcomes, um, as well as social and economic disparities. Um, what, what creates more challenge is that there, uh, there are intersections between race, age, gender, and sexuality. And so um, depending on those intersections, uh, you know, and this certainly is not an exhaustive list of the disparities, this is just a, a, a primer to them, but, but in general, as a minority, um, as with many minority groups, um, uh, there is more disparity in terms of health, social, and economic um, well-being. In terms of accessing health services, people with diverse sexualities are more likely to have seen a psychologist in the past 12 months. Um, they're less likely to have a, a regular family physician. Um, and they're more likely to have felt that they have needed health care, um, but haven't accessed it or haven't received it. And transgender people um, often have been refused care, um, and they avoid medical situations, um, and very important medical situations. So uh, they avoid emergency departments, um, and they po may postpone necessary care. And this is largely, this I shouldn't say it's largely due. There, there can be a couple of, of reasons, two or three reasons, depending on where you live in the world. But certainly um, in Canada, um, they may avoid medical uh, medical consultation because they're afraid of of how they'll be treated by their healthcare professional. So for me, I was you know when I was doing a bit of, a bit more reading, um, I thought, well, what would discrimination look like? We have in, we have implicit bias certainly, and I mean I have felt implicit bias. I mean because I identify as a gay woman and I am. And I'm and I'm cis and I'm cisgendered and I'm married to a woman who is cisgendered, um, and so so I have experienced implicit bias uh, in in a couple of of um, uh, situations with healthcare providers. But I but I got the sense that that it it truly was it wasn't intentional. There wasn't a, a, a uh, an explicit sort of discriminatory action. It was just an implicit bias, and they weren't aware of it. Uh, but I was thinking, well, what does discrimination look like um, for people in, in our community? And um, this, I took this, this table from an article uh, by Greta Bauer and her colleagues, and, and um, they did a study in Ontario, so this is within our, our context in Canada, and they were looking at, at um, transgender people and their discomfort or their experience of discomfort with their physicians. And they did a, a questionnaire, and some of the, these are these are the questions in the pink box there. These are the questions that were asked in the questionnaire. So, I mean, some of these some of these questions they directly relate to overt discrimination. So, you know, to be refused to see or or ended your care because you were trans transgender, um, told that you you don't that the, that the physician didn't know enough about trans related care to provide it. Um, you know, to to um, to be discouraged from exploring gender, right? So those are those are pretty severe behaviors. Um, and what really shocked me actually was that all of the individuals within the study, um, 37.2 percent of them had reported at least one of those behaviors if they were transmasculine, and if they were transfeminine, 38.1 percent both reported experiencing at least one of those behaviors. So that's pretty significant in terms of discrimination. So discrimination does happen. Um, from, the, from the personal context um, within the community in Edmonton here, um, those types of behaviors are extremely common. Um, and when we find a family physician that is open to trans care, um, we pass their name around the community because so few trans people actually have a family phys physician um, and just ba to access just basic like vaccinations and um, basic follow-up and medications and that kind of thing. And, um, and we end up burning out those family doctors within a few months because there are so few of them. And then, and then someone else finds a family doctor and, and we pass that name around and burn them out. And we've actually gone through um, three or four family doctors in the last two years, two, three years that I've been part of the community here, so. All right, Jenny? Yeah, so moving on to the physiotherapy context, 
Uh, myself and Megan Ross uh, recently did a study. We think it's the first study um, about LGBTIQ people and physiotherapy ever conducted in the world. Uh, it's just been published in the Journal of Physiotherapy about a few weeks ago. So this research was a simple sort of overview of how um, people who identify as LGBTIQ um, or plus in Australia, how that, what was their experience like of physiotherapy. Um, so similar in some ways to um, some of this other research that Max has been presenting, uh, the experiences of LGBTIQ people with physiotherapy were sometimes good, but often also had some problematic aspects. Um, certainly there were assumptions of heteronormativity and also cisnormativity, so assumptions that gender and sexuality um, fell into sort of the dominant paradigm um, of heterosexuality and gender binary. There also were um, reports of overt discrimination as well as um, and, and stigma, um, but also uh, a fear of stigmatisation. So people came into these contexts or avoided coming into physiotherapy context sometimes because they feared that um, given this environment where there's these assumptions made that they may experience stigma. It was interesting also that um, a lot of the participants mentioned um, that it, part of the reason for this discomfort was the nature of physiotherapy, which, you know, as, as we all know, has um, an element of um, attention to bodies. So it might involve undressing of bodies or close proximity of bodies. Um, and this can be uncomfortable for people whose bodies um, don't fall into sort of gender norms. So, so that was interesting um, as well. And the final thing that we noticed in this study was that there was overall a lack of knowledge about LGBTIQ and particularly trans specific issues that people experienced. So um, you can find this study online and there's some great tips and suggestions for um, physios uh, working with um, diverse populations in that. So what are the consequences of these things that we found? Basically, um, it overall um, resulted in a lack of cultural safety. So as I mentioned, people might sometimes avoid attending physiotherapy um, or not come back to treatment if they felt that they were being um, stigmatised or discriminated against. Um, and for fear of this kind of stigma, they, uh, this almost also may result in people not disclosing relevant information either about their conditions. Uh, pelvic physio is an important um, example, um, but also um, other other irrelevant information, such as so it may be directly re um, related to the particular issue they're coming in, but it also may just see those um, things that you need to know about people's lives that they, they're less comfortable sharing about in these contexts when they don't feel safe. And um, so that's the social context. And overall, um, of course, this would have an effect on things like rapport and connection. So the safety is a tenuous thing. Um, create and you can create safety through being inclusive and there's a lot of different ways in which we can do that in this context and we'll keep returning to this but certainly um, we can think of this in quite broadly in terms of things like policy and legislation um, interpersonal relationships that we build in our, um, uh, our connection with our patients and also creating physical spaces that feel safe for um, diverse people and again, we'll return to this as we go along. But first, speaking to um, the, the first point, the policies um, and procedures kind of uh, element, I've been involved in a diversity and inclusion movement in, w, in our global, um, in physiotherapy globally. So um, there's been a big movement towards this within WCPT, and um, we created uh, inclusive inclusivity and diversity policy. So diversity is about having a range of different people in any given context and inclusion or inclusivity is about people feeling safe and comfortable to contribute as, ourself, as themselves or ourselves in that context. So um, this policy was developed uh, with a wide range of consultation. Actually, Maxi was involved in um, as, as one of the consultants for this policy. 
it's just about to be tabled at the upcoming meeting in May for um, the, the general meeting for WCPT. So, uh, but it is available already online. You can just Google diversity, inclusion, and physiotherapy and it'll come up. But this policy has a lot of key statements which really can help us in context of LGBTIQ situations. Um, so come, some of the key things are fostering environments which actively encourage the elimination of discrimination, ongoing reflections about the assumptions and norms within the physical therapy profession, etc. I'm just going to pass back to Maxie. Right. So, I mean, legislation within within the Canadian context and within the Alberta context, um, we do have federal and provincial legislation that protects um, individuals against discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Um, and I mentioned the Delvin Vreen case. Um, that was a landmark case within Canada um, that uh, certainly changed the landscape. Um, since then, we've had marriage legislation, um, and, uh, and, and most recently, um, gender identity and gender expression. And so I, I want to reinforce that, that um, legislation, this, it, it's progressed over time. Uh, so 1998, as I said, was the Delvin Green case. Uh, but since that time, um, obviously, uh, the transgender community and gender identity expression has has most recently been included in legislation. Um, and I also believe that actually the Alberta legislation uh, w came prior to the federal legislation. So once again, Alberta, I know we think that maybe we aren't, you know, uh, pulling our weight, and uh, but, but we are. Um, so uh, so it's, uh, once again, um, I think that, that we as Albertans can can take a little bit of pride that we're that we're we're helping move the dial and hopefully continue to move it. So locally, um, I'm in Edmonton, um, but uh, we do actually have a provincial advisory council on sexual orientation and gender identity and expression, which is called SOGI. Um, so this is an advisory council that got put together about six months ago, um, and it is outside the government and it's outside um, AHS, but it advises both of those things. So it's specific to healthcare. Um, it's made up of um, healthcare providers that have an interest in especially trans care. Um, and so this includes psychiatrists that focus on um, gender identities and gender dysphoria. Um, it's endocrinologists that typically treat trans patients. It's surgeons um, that that uh, do the surgeries related to trans care, and um, pediatricians, and then there's also community members. So there's um, people that participate in TESA, which is the Trans Equality Society of Alberta, um, and they also sit on this board, the SOGI um, Council. There's moms of trans kids uh, that sit on this council. So um, it's a very um, inclusive um, council, advisory council, and it's, it can't get taken away. Um, it is outside the government, so no matter what government changes might occur, um, this council is not, um, cannot be disbanded. Um, I, I don't know um, how they get put together, but it's, it's a pretty cool thing. And there's lots of links um, that um, you can find that are related to SOGI, and there's actually an Alberta Health Services page now that focuses on trans care and trans information. So definitely check that out. There's some really good links there to follow up on what that committee is doing and what it's for. All right, so we, we've talked about policy and legislation in terms of creating safe environments for LGBTIQ people. Um, and now we're going to shift gears into safety in the interpersonal relationship. Um, and so the way I like to to think about safety, um, I, I kind of divvy it up into 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 two sort of categories. But they, these aren't mutually exclusive categories by any means. Uh, but it just helps to kind of um, communicate safety a little bit better in terms of how we go about um, creating it within relationships. So implicit safety, safety is that sense of feeling at ease when you're with somebody. Um, and, and that is hardwired into our autonomic nervous system. So we are constantly scanning our environments 
uh, through neuroception, through neuroceptive uh, processes, um, and we're, we're looking for nonverbal social cues uh, and cues in our environment. So we're, everybody is constantly doing it under our conscious awareness. Explicit safety, on the other hand, is uh, it comes through social development, so our relationships, how, we, how we're brought up, um, the institutions we've been involved in. Um, and essentially, it revolves around being seen, heard, and accepted, um, and, and also the ability to express ourselves or the space to express ourselves. And we build explicit safety in general, but simply by attending to acknowledgments um, and acknowledging individuals uh, in mature interactions. So I'm going to go over a little bit uh, about how to how to negotiate implicit safety within the, within the relationship, and then Megan's going to talk about explicit safety. So in terms of implicit safety, as I said, really this is about how we non-verbally present ourselves um, in interactions. And so, as I said, we're constantly assessing safety, danger, and life threat outside of our conscious awareness. And you can imagine if you can imagine, <laughs> being an LGBTQ person, going into a medical encounter, you maybe likely are priming yourself or you're wondering how, how much you should disclose or what you should disclose um, uh, because you're afraid that, of the response of the person across from you, of the response of your, of your medical uh, provider. Um, and as I relayed within that, within the slide previously, for, for trans people, that can be a pretty severe, uh, behavior. Um, and so already your spidey senses are tingling, uh, when you walk into, when you walk into a, a provider's, uh, uh, environment. So as providers, what we need to be is we need to be the ground. We need to be the calming influence. We need to be the non-threatening individual in the room, all right, that, the, that, the, that our patient, um, under conscious awareness, once again, is picking up that is safe, all right? Um, and so we do this through non-social, non-verbal social behaviors, and those behaviors actually help regulate our patient's fight or flight or freeze responses, so that, that sympathetic and parasympathetic response, and it also activates the positive um, parasympathetic response of relaxation. When we do that, we promote connections, all right, with others and, and um, expand our ability to engage with our environment. So we actually open up our social engagement system. And so we want to be able to be socially engaged as therapists by being calm, um, and we want to help our patients be able to, be able to engage with us by helping them regulate their nervous systems. So ultimately, as I said, we are the ground, all right, and that's our responsibility. So important nonverbal behaviors within the clinical interaction. So really, with the LGBTIQ community, or I mean any patient really, but you need to, to be aware of your responses to difference and diversity. And what I mean by that is that um, somebody might come in who looks outside of the quote-unquote norm of what we're used to. It looks outside, they look outside of the box. And our tendency is maybe to stare a little bit or, or to, to, you know, have a surprised look on our face, right? Um, and the trans community certainly goes through this a lot. They become very aware. Trans people become very aware of how people are observing them. Um, and so really, it's, it's really important for us to to have soft eye contact, um, to have gentle versus a shocked or surprised uh, facial expressions, and that our voice, that our, that our tone and the pace that we talk at is, is rich and calm and grounded versus more of a, of a high-pitched or surprised tone. Um, and I, I just want to say that I remember, like, within, within my dissertation when I was interviewing physical therapists around the therapeutic relationship, I remember one therapist telling me, uh, you know, I sometimes patients will tell you things that are completely shocking to you and you have to be the one who in your own mind even says this is normal, this is okay, this is fine, everything is normal and not present as being surprised or shocked by what's going on. Um, so those are, those are um, responses to difference in diversity but there are other ways to promote safety non-verbally 
One is by adjusting proximity. So becoming aware of how your patients are responding to how close you are to them or, or touch. Um, as Jenny was saying, uh, people, some people, transgender people in particular, uh, may have challenges with body um, and so this can be very important, especially in those situations. Uh, entrainment um, basically means matching what your patient is doing. So matching their postures, um, uh, matching their facial expressions, um, even sometimes matching their mood. So, uh, so basically what, what you're presenting to them is that you're safe, you're like them. Um, and lastly, pacing. So how quickly you move through the, through the interaction. We want to be calm and we want to be grounded. But bottom line is that, is that ultimately we need to be aware of ourselves and of our patients' responses in the interaction so that we can adapt. So when we talk about explicit safety, um, the most common form of that is in the language that we use. Um, and, and how we conduct our interviews and how we um, uh, start off the therapeutic relationship or uh, welcome someone into the clinic even. Um, and uh, acknowledging diversity and creating safe, safe spaces as well. So um, I'll go through a few different things, but we'll start off with language. So terminology, learning terms to avoid and terms that are safe to use currently. Um, keep in mind that language is fluid and does um, change over time, so keeping current with that is important. Um, learning how to use different types of pronouns and what you do um, when, how to, how to ask someone's pronouns to begin with and what you do if you mess up pronouns. Um, and then how do you um, ask certain questions and, and know whether you should be asking that question to begin, begin with. So I'll go through each of those. Um, so the first one is terminology. Terms to avoid. Um, I, I don't even feel like I want to say most of these um, because they're so um, offensive. But um, the, the top one is very common still. That a lot of people don't know how to phrase that. So um, it's not... Um, acceptable any longer to say biologic, what is your biological gender or your, what are you gen genetically male or female or born a man or a woman because a lot of trans people feel like they were always their chosen gender, they were born that way. Um, not everyone does, but that is a common experience. Um, so um, we use sex assigned at birth um, instead. Um, and then another one I just wanted to point out here is a sex change or sex reassignment surgery. Um, we use uh, gender affirming surgery. Um, that's the, the appropriate term to use at this point. Um, and um, just to keep in mind that there are many different types of surgeries. Um, and then uh, transgendered as a verb or transgenderism um, to transgender. Um, it's not, that's, that's not how we use that term. That is not an appropriate phrase. Um, someone is trans or transgender. They have not transgendered. Um, they may have transitioned. Um, but generally the transition process is ongoing and is kind of a lifetime experience. Um, so just keep in mind there is not really a start, start time and an end time for that. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of other terms there to kind of avoid. And then here's the list of appropriate or neutral terms. So sex assigned at birth I mentioned, um, gender confirmation surgery or surgeries, um, and then transgender man, transgender woman um, is, are, are appropriate terms. Female to male um, transgender or F to M um, trans person, male to female trans person, um, those are appropriate terms, um, usually only if the person identifies that way. So they would st they would provide you with that term, and then you could use that in your charting or reflect that back to them. Gender neutral or non-binary is a um, another term that's kind of newer and is appropriate. Um, and yeah, so that's your list of terms to kind of um, that would be safe or appropriate to use. And then there's a whole bunch more. So definitely click that link at the bottom um, and and keep some of that available to you. So the next one is pronouns. Um, getting someone's pronouns correct is the most important thing you can do to show them respect. So um, 
this is kind of an, it's, it's assumed to be an automatic thing in day-to-day -day life that when you see someone who presents or, or their voice sounds female or feminine, that you would use she, her pronouns. That's just kind of an assumption. You can look at people passing on the street and you gen automatically assume their pronouns implicitly. Um, so to be aware that that is actually something you're doing um, and to try and um, avoid that as much as possible, um, especially if there's someone who doesn't quite fit, um, try not to guess. It's much safer to ask. Um, and then if they provide you with pronouns that you weren't expecting, avoid that surprised um, expression and the surprised voice that Maxie was talking about. Um, think this is normal, this is okay, I can do this. Um, definitely practice with those pronouns. Take a friend who's willing to practice with you um, and just talk about that person, make up a story and tell them a story about someone using the pronouns that you're not as familiar with. Um, so the, the more common one that people slip up with are they, them. But if you picture someone who has a very deep voice, has um, a very square jaw, is very tall and broad, if they come into your clinic and they say, I use she or her pronouns, that can be very difficult for some people to, to wrap their head around. So keep that in mind, that that could be happening, especially for over the phone when their voice is quite deep um, or, or vice versa, if someone's voice is very high um, and they say, I, I, I identify as he, him, I, I use male pronouns. Um, the receptionist or um, front desk should be able to adapt to that. There should be a way in your system to put in those pronouns so that and flag it so that people talking over the phone will not refer to them in incorrectly. Um, that is very, very important, and that will often just automatically turn a patient away from your clinic if, if that's happening over the phone. Um, how do you, so I also want to go over how you ask someone's pronouns. So the most common way is, um, or safest way is to identify your pronouns first. Keep in mind that you are coming, if you are cisgendered, you are coming from a place of privilege when you are doing this, so it is very easy for you to say, I identify, um, I, use, I use she, her pronouns, what are your pronouns? So try to say it with some um, sensitivity. Don't ask that in the middle of the reception area, for example. Um, don't ask it um, before you've introduced yourself. Um, you know, start the therapeutic interaction in a, in a safe, um, isolated environment where they might feel more comfortable um, identifying their, their correct pronouns. If they say, there's also neo-pronouns, so that's these are, um, I forget all the rest of them, there's a whole bunch. Um, so if they're pronouns that you're not familiar with at all, um, just be aware that that's, you, you can say, oh, I'm not familiar with that pronoun, I've never used that before. Um, can you give me a sample sentence? Okay, I'm going to try to use those pronouns. Is it okay if I use your name as much as possible or avoid pronouns um, until I get better at that? So that's one way you can phrase that interaction a little bit. Um, and then what do you do if you make a mistake? So if you are trying to use the, the correct pronouns, you're doing really well with it, and then you mess up on a sentence. Um, you're kind of halfway through your sentence, you say the wrong pronoun, stop yourself, say, oh, sorry, correct yourself to say the correct pronoun, and then move on. Continue with the information you were giving or your sentence, go back to the subject matter, try not to make a huge deal of, about it and be super apologetic because then you're putting them in a position of saying, oh, don't worry about it, it's okay. And that's not okay. You don't want them to be apologizing. Um, it's not about you. Um, it's your responsibility to show your respect by using correct pronouns. Um, what if you get through, like halfway through an interview and you did establish their pronouns at the beginning or they stop you halfway through and, you, and say, you know what, my pronouns are not she, her, they're he, him, I'd like you to use those. And and you're already halfway through the, the interview or the interaction, you can, you can express that um, you're, you're feeling uncomfortable and you're, you're, you feel bad that you've been doing it incorrectly and you're going to try harder. But if you don't actually start correcting yourself, that comes off as very fake. Um, so really work on that. Um, and, and like I said, practice. Tell stories um, about someone. Um, using different pronouns that you're not as used to um, and just get used to listening to how you're talking, listening to every time you say a pronoun and slow yourself down when you're having, you're having interactions. It's better to speak slowly and think about it and have awkward pauses in your sentence and get it correct than, uh, than to speak quickly and get it wrong.
Okay, so the last one is questions. Um, why, what questions do you ask and why are you asking them? So how do you know what medical questions you need to ask, um, especially for trans people, um, that might be related to the condition that, you, that they're coming to see you for? How much about their transition do you need to know? Um, what sexuality and gender questions might you need to know and how do you phrase them? Um, things like, do you have a husband at home who can help you with your recovery? Maybe you could rephrase that as, do you have a support system? Do you have friends or family who can support you through your recovery? Um, what are ways of asking questions that are more open-ended? So, for example, um, you disclosed to me at the beginning that you identify as trans. I was just wondering if there's anything related to your transition process that might be related to um, what you've come um, to see me today, um, whether that's surgeries or hormones, I'm not sure, but I just wanted to, to, to find out if you have um, anything you wanted to talk about that might be relevant, just so I don't miss anything. And if they say no, I don't think so, then move on. It is not their job to educate you on the transition process. It is not, um, often they don't have the energy for it because they have to educate everyone around them. Um, so really be aware of why you're asking the questions. Is it something that you need to know and you know that that's something you need to ask um, versus is it something that you want to know or you're curious about because that is not generally an appropriate reason to be asking that question in that therapeutic environment. Um, anything that you just want to know, you should be finding out on your own. Um, if, you, if you feel like you need to know it, Rather than just asking the question outright, um, because that might come across as a curiosity question, especially if the, the person doesn't know why, because they're not familiar with physiotherapy, um, start off with why you need to know it. Like explain, um, so for example, pelvic health, I understand you're having a lot of pain in your pelvic region. Um, I, I have a, a couple questions I'd like to ask about surgeries, whether you've had any surgery in that area, um, is that okay if I ask? and then go from there. Um, so really, really be explicit about why you want the information and that it is relevant, um, and that'll really help continue that therapeutic safe relationship. So the last, the, another aspect of explicit safety is the physical space. So this is making sure you have supportive signage, um, so neutral bathroom signs, um, uh, signs up that have a variety of genders represented, so some gender non-conforming representations of people, some homosexual couples potentially, um, gay couples, um, queer families, anything like that, um, having um, positive space stickers or trans flags up um, is really important, but only be really cautious with that. Only put those up once you know for sure that your clinic and all the staff in the clinic have gone through education and are trans positive and, and LGBT um, positive. Because if they're not and you put that signage up, it's encouraging someone to let down their guard and come in. And then it's a lot more shocking if something does occur in, in your clinic space. Um, try to have private rooms for assessments. So not only physically private, but also sound private so that so like a closed door, not just a curtain, um, so that someone can talk to you about um, their transition process and not feel, feel like they're um, talking about it to the whole room. Um, really watch where you have mirrors. So if the only space where you do exercise is has mirrors all around, that can cause a lot of um, dysphoria for people. Um, and this is another um, sensitive area for people of different body sizes as well. So it's not just trans people, but it's ex it is one of those things that trans people struggle with. So try to have an, an exercise space that doesn't have any mirrors around. Um, and then I talked about this before, but the front desk assumptions. Um, so how someone sounds on the phone versus how they identify can be very different. Um, make sure that your system, your computer system and your charting system has space for you to identify how someone, like what their, what their name and what their pronouns are. Um, and, and even though, even if your system has to match their legal identity so that for insurance purposes, um, try to have somewhere where you can identify um, the way that they should be referred to next time. Um, yeah, and try to have 
private bathrooms with just a bathroom sign on the door instead of a gendered, a gendered sign. Um, so another area is that, uh, that language comes up in is paperwork. So intake forms, having neutral language, um, such as parent or guardian, um, spouse or partner, um, children or child. Um, this is getting more common, but just review when you go back to your clinic or, or your um, setting, your practice setting, review your forms and just make sure that they are actually gender neutral and, and inclusive. Look at the gender options. Um, is it a tick box or a circle, male or female? Are there other options? Is there a blank space? Can you add a section for other that they can put? Um, or can you just say, please provide your gender, like gender colon, blank space? Um, this is really important um, for trans community um, and gender nonconforming people in general. Um, there are some examples of these um, intake forms on the SOGI uh, website, so definitely look at those resources. Okay, so now we're going to go into a focus on trans health um, specific to physiotherapy. Um, so I, th I talked about this before, but it is your job as a health professional to look up what you don't know um, and find out what aspects of, of a trans person's experience might be relevant to the areas of focus in your practice. Um, one of the guidelines that can take you through the kind of the basic medical transition process is the WPATH guidelines. Um, and so you can, you can Google that. It's quite a lengthy document. It's designed for medical um, practitioners, so doctors. Um, so there's a lot of areas that won't be relevant, but it just gives you a, a good overview. Um, what they don't tell you is that often in transgender health, there are long, long wait times for all of the um, steps in the transition process. Just to get into see a psychiatrist to get a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, which is still required for um, a lot of the surgeries and, and having it covered, um, is a year to a year and a half wait for that initial appointment. Um, and then it's six months to a year for a follow-up appointment. And you have to have a follow-up before you can get put on any lists. Um, so it's extremely long and slow process. There's a lack of access to appropriate procedures or clear guidelines. Um, and even with the publicized guidelines, um, people don't know where to access them. Medical professionals often don't know where to find them or that they're even available. Um, they haven't looked them up. Um, they don't feel comfortable following them, even though it's an explicit guideline. Um, there's misinformation, so um, the, uh, the medical community might have, like, a family doctor might have gone to a seminar five years ago um, that talked them through the transition process, which has since changed significantly um, because it is evolving, and um, when someone goes to that doctor um, and expresses dysphoria, um, the, um, the doctor will say, oh, yeah, I'm familiar with this. This is, this is how, it, um, how the process is and that's no longer true, but they're not willing to look up more information, so that's complacency. Um, but on the flip side, there are many good support groups and advocacy organizations, including PFLAG um, and passionate individuals um, that are fighting um, on the SOGI committee um, and various other places to, to change this, um, this access. Um, so in physiotherapy, the, the biggest areas that I've come across in terms of transition or, or um, the, the experience of being trans in the medical transition process is our posture and binding. So this is most common for trans men or masculine presenting people. Um, so they, they, if they have breasts or breast tissue, they tend to hunch and curl forward to, and, and wear baggy or clothes to hide um, the appearance of breasts. They also wear a very tight garment called a binder um, that compresses their breast tissue, um, which, as you can imagine, stiffens the ribs, um, constricts the lungs, um, stiffens the spine, can even cause um, rib fractures over time. So looking up some information on that would be really important. Um, teaching them stretching exercises just like you would for anyone with a stiff um, thoracic area um, would be important. And um, keep in mind that talking to them about uh, binding is a very sensitive issue. They do it to minimize um, their mental and emotional pain. 
So um, it's often not an option to just stop binding altogether, but you can talk to them about a wearing schedule, how long to wear it for, safe ways to bind garments that are safer, um, as opposed to using tape or um, ace bandages. Um, another area is skin grafting for trans men when they have a phalloplasty, so that's a, the, the surgical creation of um, a phallus. Um, and then the last one is pelvic health, and that's usually for trans women who have had a vaginoplasty, um, and they have to go through a set of like using dilators and everything like that. Um, so those are things you can look up. And uh, in terms of resources, that's a nice segue. Um, we just listed a few resources here. Uh, certainly, these, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, we've referenced um, the AHS site quite a bit during this presentation. There's also the EGAL, Canadian Human Rights Trust site. That's essentially the LGBTQ um, uh, uh, human rights uh, website and group. Uh, the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention also provides um, uh, health-specific information. And there's a fantastic video uh, that uh, students in Australia did, um, uh, physio students actually, so it's really great. I, I, I can't remember the university they were at, uh, but this is the YouTube video. University Excellent. Of uh, university of Melbourne. Shout out to them. And these are the uh, SOGI, uh, the SOGI links as well. So not exhaustive, uh, but it's a start for you. Um, and so in conclusion, what we'd like to say is um, challenge your assumptions um, and, and be aware of your assumptions and be reflective. Um, consider ways of making more inclusive physical spaces. Sometimes you're not going to be able to do everything all at once, uh, but, but um, working through that over time um, I think is really important. And lastly, educate yourself and seek out resources. As a healthcare professional, it is your responsibility to, um, to educate yourself um, uh, within all populations that we work with. And uh, any questions? <laughs> I don't know that we have much time, but. Well, we, we do have time for a few questions, so I'm going to give the audience an opportunity to type in any questions they may have, and, and while we give the opportunity to them to type in their questions, I'm going to ask you a couple of mine that came up uh, during the, the presentation. Uh, so my first question is for Megan, and it's around the term queer, um, because that term in the acronym is, is one that, um, for me, um, it, it, it has certain connotations, and so I'm, I want to understand what the meaning of queer is to the LGBTQI2S community, and, and, and I guess I'm interested in the fact that it wasn't on your list of neutral or appropriate terms, and yet it's part of the acronym, and I'm trying to understand that. Yeah, um, that is, it, it probably could have been. It's one of the terms that is Newer, it's a reclaimed term, so it was used as a slur in um, older generations, um, previous generations, and so there are many people in the queer community that are not comfortable with that term and don't identify with it, but most um, in the last couple generations would be pretty comfortable with it. It is used as an umbrella term for anyone that is not heterosexual or cisgendered. So it's it's the biggest umbrella for the queer community that we have, which is why we call it the queer community. So it's it's kind of the term that encompasses everything else. Um, and and some people only identify using that term. That's the only one they they associate with because it is so broad, um, and identity is often fluid. Okay. And as you said, it's a really bad term. Yeah, it is a reclaimed term, yeah. So some people won't be comfortable with it. So it's not a term that I would recommend applying to someone, but it is something that you can you can use if they use it for themselves. Okay. Thanks for answering that question. My uh, my next question for you, uh, Megan, is and and just so happens all your all my questions come to you uh, tonight. But um, when you were talking uh, back at slide 17, you're talking about uh, burning out family doctors or local family doctors and one of the excuses being given was that the the doctors refusing to see people from the LGBTQ community because um, because they, they say they don't know enough about uh, trans care to provide care. I, I just wanted to understand 
were they declining to provide care that was specific to um, being transgendered, or were they declining to provide care because the individual, like basic care, because an individual is transgendered? Not that that really both. makes a difference, but I'm curious. Both. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it is both. Um, so there's the, there's two different. Um, both of those situations come up. So, so often people, trans people, are looking for a family doctor who will feel comfortable providing um, referrals to endocrinology, um, referrals for surgery. And the the previous uh, way that the process worked was that you had to have a diagnosis from a psychiatrist of gender dysphoria in order to get those referrals. And so the family doctor could provide you with the referral to the psychiatrist, but they wouldn't provide you with a referral anywhere else. That is no longer the case because. Um, the medical profession has actually put together algorithms for family doctors to follow in order to prescribe um, hormone replacement therapy. And, but many family doctors have not kept up with that and are not comfortable doing that despite a very clear algorithm available to them. Um, so so that was part, that's part of it, that they won't provide the care. And then the other part of it is it just that there's a lot of family doctors are just so uncomfortable talking about it and they don't feel like they know enough about it to know when other medications will be interacting with those hormones or um, they don't know how to talk to their patient, they have a really uncomfortable interaction with them and then the trans person isn't gonna come back because they felt very disrespected. So they're not gonna wanna go back to that family doctor for any, even if it's just regular healthcare. Thanks for that answer. The challenge there from, I guess, is, is you, you want people that are practicing within their competence, but then it's a two-edged sword because they're not comfortable enough to maintain their competence, then nobody's competent, and then you end up with a problem where there's yeah. no care available. Yep. Yeah. Can't pick and choose what they're competent enough. Yeah, and we, we try to encourage people in the community to flag those doctors that are either refusing care or refusing to follow a basic algorithm, um, and we have... We, we try to pass on the information around the community that there is an algorithm out there and where that where family doctors can access that so that when they go in asking for HRT, they can say, they can provide the family doctor with the link to the algorithm and say, this is your information available for you. Like, it's kind of ridiculous that we are having to tell the family doctors where the, their medical, bo like, organizing body is providing the resources because that's where that information came from. And we are giving them the link to say, look it up where you're supposed to be looking up your information right. and do your job. So, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, and my last So I just don't want physios to have... Go ahead. I just don't want physios to, to have a similar reputation. I want physios to be better than that. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree with you. Um, my last question, and, and, and maybe it's really obvious, but I'm, it's, it's max, going to Maxi, and it has to do with the intersection, uh, and intersectionality, I think is the term you used. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure I understood you correctly when you were talking about intersectionality, and I hope I'm using that term correctly. It, it, my understanding is that it's, it's basically a piling on effect of disparity, where, or a cumulative effect of disparity, where if somebody is, um, is, uh, has a non-conforming gender identity, or um, probably the wrong language, but uh, and then on top of that, they are a member of a visible minority, and on top of that, they're um, maybe impoverished. That the, the disparity that they experience in the health system and elsewhere becomes a cumulative, increasingly disparity situation. Is that correct? Um, I, I well, I think it can, it. it Individuals who who have intersections of race, let's say they're they're of color, and um, you know they're trans, um, will yeah can have in certain in certain terms you know discriminatory um, or stigmatizing different types of stigmatizing experiences. So I suppose you could call it a pylon in some ways, um, or there can just be difference um, in terms of the, for example, the types of health um, uh, outcomes or the types of of, of conditions that they that they experience. So um, with that slide, I wasn't trying to suggest that every single LGBTQ person um, is at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, right? Um, so it, 
there's the challenges with with intersection. Um, and Jenny, I know, probably could speak to this certainly better than I can in terms of defining intersectionality, but um, that's my perspective of it. Yeah. Um, in the narrow um, I guess terms. it's just that, that, yeah, I guess it's just that these things affect each other and in ways that aren't necessarily predictable, but if you have more than one, if you're a part of more than one minority, that may affect how well you're managed in a particular setting. So I think I think that's probably as far as we need to go with it in terms of it's just good to be aware that not everyone's going to have the same experience as being lesbian, for example, because um, it may be different if you're also disabled. Thank you for clarifying that. That it, so it's not necessarily it's not linear. I guess is what I'm taking away from that comment, or or predictable in a linear fashion. Yeah. Right, okay. and there's and there's very little there's very limited research as well. So it's hard to get data. Um, the the community um, certain aspects parts of the community um, because uh, there's been discrimination in the past. They're very reluctant to participate um, in disclosing you know um, personal information within research studies. Let's say. Um, and so, so there's a lot of challenges with with actually getting research on um, you know this population and the intersections um, as well. But but it, there is some out there certainly. Okay, thanks very much. That helps. That helps to understand. Um, it we've. I appreciate all of the information. We've we've kept you longer than we promised. It's it's uh, well past uh, the time when I said we'd be done. So uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Megan, Jenny, and Maxie. It was an excellent presentation. I learned a lot. I hope that our audience feels the same way. There there was a tremendous amount of information, and I think a lot to digest and and reflect on. And so I, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be here with us today and taking the time uh, to help all of us understand better diversity and inclusion in physiotherapy practice and how we can do this better as we go forward um, and as time continues to pass. And with that, I will say thank you to our audience and good night, everyone.